the, the journey of our faith, the long journey of faith. Um, it's a, really a long, a long journey to come to Christmas. So I want to meditate about God's plan of Christmas. Because when we think of Christmas, we think of uh, our Christmas right now. We think of uh, also the, maybe the Christmas story that took place with Mary and all of this. But actually what I want to do this morning is go way back. Because the Christmas story is not only this. The Christmas story started in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned. Uh, it was a thousand of years in the making. The Christmas story is a long story of details in the calendar of God and the faithfulness of God, uh, putting uh, before our eyes the love of God, the patience of God. There's a lot of waiting and anticipation in the, in, in the story of Christmas. It's so, so much more than the events that we celebrate that comes from Bethlehem. It is so much more. Uh, Abraham and his wife waited for a child for decades. They, they waited a long time, 25 years, and she was not able to conceive. And when Sarah was 90 years old, this is when God appeared to Abraham and promised that Sarah would give birth to a son. And this child, with this child, God would establish a covenant with the descendants of Abraham and it would be an uh, everlasting covenant. And that is, again, a moment that is so, so special. So let's read this, this text here. God replied, No, Sarah, your wife, will give birth to a son for you. You will name him Isaac, and I will confirm my covenant with him and his descendants as an everlasting covenant. Sarah was listening to this conversation from the tent. Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time, and Sarah was long past the age of having children. So she laughed silently to herself and says, how could a worn out woman like me enjoy such pleasure, especially that my Lord is also so old? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? And pay attention to what God says here. This is important to us. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And the Lord is in the making of his plans and he's, uh, and, and, you know, knitting people, events uh, with miraculous, uh, supernatural things that is happening. Sarah laughed because how could she, at 90 years old, and her husband was so old, how could she? And yet, God made it that she became pregnant. And that becomes like a, a foundation of faith in the Bible. That birth is, is a statement of God's ability, of, of God's working, of God, what God can do to, to bring to pass, to the fulfillment, his plan of redemption. The name of this child should be Isaac. It would bring laughter because, of course, that's kind of a funny story that an old lady, 90 years old, becomes pregnant. But the laughter is so much more that. It is the, the joy that they have been waiting for. They've been waiting for 25 years. It was not going to happen. And then suddenly it comes like, wow, laughter. But it's also the, what would come out of this, of this son that would bring redemption to mankind. So it brings laughter to, to all. Many of you today who talk about memories of Christmas emphasize the joy of the season. And, and this is part of the, of the name here. And the joy also is part of this, uh, how God can work through an impossible situation. And think about your impossible situation. God can work an impossible situation. He has done it over and over. And he asks, is anything too hard for the Lord? We know it's a rhetorical question. The answer is, of course, of course, he, he can do everything. So Isaac's son was J Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. The story continues. And one of the sons was Judah. Out of the tribe of Judah came King David, 
And we have so many prophecies of the Old Testament emphasizing that the future king that would be the savior, the Messiah, would be out of that uh, tribe, a descendant of King David. And Mary herself was a descendant of King David as Joseph, the earthly father, was also. So Jesus, the Savior, became the fruit of God's promise to Abraham. So it, it, it is linked and it continues. So that's why, that's why I'm saying that Christmas, this Christmas that we celebrate, it is, is a work. It, we have been waiting for that. It's been, it's been thousands of years, a, 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 a work of God. So Sarah is giving birth to her old age. It gives us another reason to, to uh, build our faith upon. There's a lot of that kind of foundation in the Bible. And then, after God gave these promises of the Savior, he began revealing more about this special birth, this special child, this special king, uh, through the prophets. More than 680 years before the birth of Jesus, God told Isaiah, that the Savior would have a virgin as a mother and the, the child would be God himself. So this is very, very specific when you think about that, this kind of prophecies. It's very specific. The accuracy of this one claim alone is miraculous. And we had to wait a long time for the fulfillment of such a promise. And I want to just, uh, I hope it will be quick, but I don't know how quick it will be. But I was reading recently about a very smart man. Uh, he's a scientist, he's a mathematician and an astronomer, uh, Peter Stoner, I don't know if you know him, but if any of you are interested to know more about what I'm going to, to summarize, I can give you the website, Science Speaks, Peter Stoner. He's, he has title long like this and his uh, capacities, uh, chairman of the Department of Mathematics and Astronomy, Pasadena City College, chairman of science division in Westmont College, professor emeritus of science in another college, professor emeritus of mathematics and astronomy in another college, so he, he's, he's, he's the real thing. And based on the principle that Christ has said, uh, you are searching scriptures to know about the Messiah. They, they are the one bearing witness to me. So based on that, he started to investigate some of the prophecies about the Messiah and uh, see and find evidence uh, whether they applied to Jesus Christ. And if you find these prophecies to be fulfilled in Christ, then not only they prove who Jesus is, who Jesus claimed to be, but it also proves that God is the one who gave these prophecies to the prophets. And think about the complexity of that. Different authors, different writers, different age, different level of education, different social status. You have kings, you have shepherds, you have uh, all sorts of people who have uh, priests uh, that have written at different time speaking specific descriptions of that special birth, of that special king. And then you realize when you look at all of this, it all makes sense at the end. And we celebrate Christmas because it has been fulfilled. So anyway, coming back to Peter Stoner, he's been studying that. And uh, Peter Stoner calculated the probability of one man fulfilling the major prophecies made concerning the Messiah. And he chose 12 classes of university students with 600 students, and they discussed and examined each prophecy in detail to evaluate the possibility or the probability that any other man could have fulfilled them. And they made a very conservative estimate and the result I'm going to share with you in a moment. It's based on the principle of probability and evaluating the prophecies made of Christ. We have to answer this one question regarding each prophecy. One man and how many has fulfilled this prophecy? So this is based on that one question. How many men could have fulfilled this prophecy? So if we go to the next slide, you will see a, a summary. He, they, they have started with 108 prophecies. They selected eight of these. So the first one is Bethlehem, the birth of Bethlehem. So, and the ruler would come 
who has his origin comes from eternity. So this prophecy predicts that Christ would be born in Bethlehem, but how many men have been born in, in Bethlehem? So that doesn't prove a lot of things. The second one, behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. Our question here is, of the men who have been born in Bethlehem, one man and how many has had a forerunner to announce his coming? Oh, that becomes a bit more difficult. The student says that the prophecy apparently referred to a special messenger of God whose one duty was to prepare the way for the work of Christ. So there was more restriction added to the prophecy. Number three, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Zion, um, you, your king is coming to thee, uh, having salvation, lowly, riding upon a colt, a foal of an ass. Okay, our question is, how many men was born in Bethlehem, had a forerunner, did enter Jerusalem as a king on a call, the fall of an ass, to become very restrictive at this point, at this point. So the students said it is very hard to place an estimate on that kind of things. They knew of no one but Christ who had so entered. Number four, one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Christ was betrayed by Judas, one of his disciples, causing him to be put to death, and wounds have been made in his hands. And there seems to be maybe no relation between these prophecies and the others, but actually there is. We may ask the question, one man and how many in the world over has been betrayed by a friend, and that betrayal has resulted in being wounded by his hands. Number five. And I said unto them, if ye think good, give me my price, if not forbear. So they wait for my price, 30 pieces of silver. The question here is simple. Of the people who have been betrayed, one and how many have been betrayed for exactly 30 pieces of silver? And then the students thought it was extremely rare. Number six, and the Lord said to me, cast it under the potter, a goodly price that I was prized at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. This is extremely specific. 30 pieces of silvers are not to be returned to, to, the, to Judas, the, the betrayer. They are to be cast down in the house of the Lord and they are to go to the potter. You will recall that Judas and remorse returned the 30 pieces of silver the priest rejected to take them back because it was already the price has been paid. So he threw them on the floor. They took the piece of silver and they bought the, the, the land over there for that, for that price. It's very, very specific. One man and how many after receiving a bribe for the betrayal of a friend has returned the money the money has been refused had thrown it on the floor of the house of the Lord and then had it to purchase a field from the potter. The student says they doubted if there are any other incidents involving all of these events. Number seven, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth. So the question here, when he was oppressed and afflicted, how many we can apply this to them, though innocent, make no defense for himself? So the student says it, they only knew that it happened of Christ. Number eight, for dogs have encompassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. So a question is, one man and how many from the time of David on has been crucified? It's just like that. So the, pro the probability of all eight prophecies being fulfilled accidentally is one with 17 zero after. One million is six zeros. So we add to 17 zero the probability that this kind of prophecies could be fulfilled just by coincidence is one on 100 quadrillion. That's a big, big number, 17 zero after that. So in such a case, the prophets have spoken these prophecies at different time in the history and it proves it's being absolute. So for those of you, just as a conclusion, if you are in business 
and uh, you are balancing whether an investment is, is worth to, to do it, and you have nine chances on 10 to be a good deal. Okay, so one chance may be not good, but nine on 10, it says that it would be a good deal you can make a profit of that. Of course, you would be inclined to go and uh, do the business transaction. But now we're talking one on 100 quadrillion. So that is a sure deal that for us to base off of this, we call it an absolute proof. And uh, Mr. Stoner has presented his claim to the, let me see, I have it here uh, somewhere. They presented it to the Committee of the American Scientific Aff Affiliation, and upon examination, they verified that these calculations were dependable and accurate in regard to the scientific material presented. So it, it, is, it is a sure thing. So any man who would reject Christ as a son of God is rejecting a fact proved perhaps more absolutely than any other fact of the world. And to me, Christmas is becoming more important every year uh, because I discover doctrines, the doctrines of faith, the values, the story, the proof, uh, gives me values. It gives me solid ground. It gives me the hope for eternity. It gives me certainty. So to me, Christmas is becoming more and more important. I remember, it, was it a few years ago, I had some sort of understanding about Christmas when we had the nice uh, play that uh, May, May had uh, built here and we had the, the, the Christmas uh, uh, display here. And that year I was uh, reminded how the traditions of Christianity is important to be told. Like uh, uh, some of you said that the play that you have uh, shown in the church or that you would go to church and then every year you, you, you go through that, how it has created something in your heart. It has deposited a, a story of an event that is real. But me, the more I go through Christmas as a Christian, I find solid evidence. Uh, proof that are absolute for me so that a, a, as we live in a world that is filled with doubt and you know the, the, the wonderful Christmas story starts with Mary becoming pregnant okay so that is what, what we see in the next of the story it is being questioned is it really possible these kind of things confused and disturbed Mary tried to think what the angels could mean don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. Again, the, the long making of this old story. And he will reign over Israel forever. It, the kingdom will never end. So this is the, the f kind of the final picture or the final time. Time has finally arrived where the promise of God has to be fulfilled. Until now, this is a preparation. Events are coming. We are announcing a child. We are announcing a multitude of prophecies what the child will, will come, where he will be born, and all of this kind. But now, the very special moment, how he is God going to be placed in the belly of Mary. How will it be happening? This, the, he had to come as a man. This is an incredible story when you think about that. First, the Savior had to be placed in his mother's womb. So we come to that story at this place. And now, I, I know it doesn't really make sense, but as human beings, we like to anticipate or imagine something. We have great imagination. So try to imagine heaven at this very moment. Like uh, the God is going to be formed in the womb of Mary. It's it, all the, the long journey of faith, the, the announcements of the prophets comes to this one point in time where this miracle 
is going to happen. I think to me it's mind blowing to think about this, this, these things. So I'm trying to imagine what's the conversation in heaven. Well, what's how people are, are thinking about not people, but how whatever uh, creatures were in heaven. This moment had been thousands of years in the making. Think about Mary as Christmas approach. Put yourself in her shoes about how overwhelming it was for her to accept the idea, just the idea that the Holy Spirit, she would become pregnant and she would give birth to God and, and, and the flesh or something like that. And as a child of God for us today in this room, maybe it is hard for us also to accept the idea that God can work in your life because God said to her, I'm choosing you. I favored you. You are part of my plan. I want, I want to use you to make a difference. And it is, this is wonderful. If we go a little bit further to discover the God of the impossible, Mary said uh, to the angel, but how can this be? You know, this is a question that all of us, we ask when we don't understand something. When we don't see the possible, the impossible becoming possible, we, we, we cannot get it. It's, how can it be possible? How can it happen? It's not possible. I remember when God called me to go to China when I was uh, back in Canada many years ago. How can it be possible? I don't have money, I don't have this. A any, any challenge, any time God is speaking to you to call you to, to specific ministry or to go do a step of faith, you will have at some point in your mind, how can it be possible? How, how can God make it happen? And this is wh what happened. She questioned how something that seemed impossible could be possible. Now I want you to uh, observe Three reasons that sustain our faith and can sustain her. And, and the angels reply. First of all, the Holy Spirit. So there are things we are not going to understand about the power of God. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. God is answering a question, how can it be? She cannot see how it will be. I, I don't know a man in this way and in this intimate way. The Holy Spirit, number one. Number two, you will see the power of the Most High. So the Holy Spirit, the power of the Most High. But the third one, again, refer to an event that took place again at, to, toward a barren woman, Elizabeth, and her old age could not give birth to a child. And the third argument and the reply, look, your cousin. Look, your relative, you, you see, she was in her old age, she was told to be barren, now she is six months pregnant. For, again, look at what the angel says, for nothing will be impossible with God. We are the one that creates doubts and that creates, you know, in our mind, this is not possible, I cannot believe this, I cannot. Because we do not understand the Holy Spirit we do not understand the power of God, and we don't look enough in the scriptures to see all the supernatural and the miraculous event that God has done, has shown us to build up our faith into these impossible situations. You know, until now, the virgin birth is very questioned by atheists all over. Books have been written, TV program, interviews. Anybody who wants to contradict the Christian faith, one of the first things they will attack is the, is the Christian birth, is the, 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 the virgin birth of Mary. Oh, it's not possible, not possible. But God says it is possible for nothing is impossible to God. And look, your relative, she was barren. So you have Sarah who was barren. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? And the relative, ah, for nothing is impossible to the Lord. And the, the Lord is building up our faith this morning through the Christmas. So is it difficult for you to imagine or trust that God can work into your impossible situation? Number three, I'm closing with this last thought. Many times we think of Christmas and we confuse Christmas with what, how the world uh, celebrates Christmas. And I'm so happy that this morning and the testimonies, uh, this has been clarified. We celebrate this way, but when I discovered Jesus as my Savior, the meaning, the understanding has changed. So have we lost the center truth of Christmas? Christmas is, uh, we have many viewpoints on Christmas. The gifts exchange, 
it's fun. Families to coming together, it's fun. Um, uh, there's a seasons of peace and love. Uh, we have many romantic comedy. You drink a coffee, eat a cookie, and watch a romantic comedy in Christmas time. And I read the, the, the story of a lady and the grocery store. It just happened, I think, last week. It was in the news. She went in the, with, she had a big, 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 huge basket because she was buying for, for Christmas for her family. And just behind her, there's a man who has just two little packets. So she's kind and she let this man, you go first because you see I have a lot. So the man was touched by her kindness. So when he came to the, to the to to pay, he says, "I want to pay for the grocery of this lady." So this lady started to cry. And, uh, so she, she um, connected what happened to her, the act of kindness to Christmas season. So okay, th this is all true. This is all correct. But we know. The purpose of Christmas is not ju just to make us feel good, have a Christmas tree, sing caroling, and things like that. It's about sin. It's about sin. It's a miracle. So the first promise that God gave was about Christmas. In the Garden of Eden, he announced a redemption. And he reveals his plan to remove sin. Adam and Eve sinned. Sin robbed us of innocence. And God could not relate to sinners. So he had a plan from before the existence of this world. Jesus was going to be part of history, of our history of human being. And Christmas marks the fulfillment of God's process to restore our relationship to him. And to me, I just want to uh, finish with that thought. This is Christmas. This is a long, thousands of years in the making, and God has resolved and his love to remove our sin and to bring us back to him. So he had to come to us and reveal uh, his heart to us. He's the Prince of Peace. He, he calms our anxieties. He, he heals us. He came to be bruised. He knew he was going to suffer and be rejected. He's done it for us. So this is really, really wonderful. And uh, as uh, the musicians are preparing, we're going to end our s service and praising and worship. Mary said, I am a servant of the Lord. Let this happen to me according to your word. Blessed is he, is she, who has, that is Elizabeth saying that to Mary. Blessed is Mary or anyone who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise. God is faithful. God is love. God has worked this wonderful plan. No one could have designed so many details connected. You know, when you read the Bible, one of the things that is the most boring in the Bible, but maybe one of the most important, are the genealogies, where you follow from Adam to Jesus Christ, and, and you follow the tread of, of, of the chosen one. You, you follow that. And the Bible never hides uh, the failings and the weakness and the flaws of the sinful nature of man. All of our Christian heroes have such so many flaws. But Jesus Christ came. So the Bible is so sure, should give us so much assurance. And the celebration of Christmas is such a, a foundation, a sure foundation of our faith. So let us rejoice in that Christmas because God loves us so much that he came to remove our sins and bring us to him. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Please, brother, praise the Lord. Amen.